Hi, how are you all doing today? We'll get started in just a minute. We'll just wait for a few more people to join us and then we'll make a start on our on our on our workshop today. Okay, hi, how are you all doing today? Uh, I'm Adam Taylor, and today we're gonna to have a workshop which we're gonna create uh, for the uh, basis three board. We're gonna create a breakout game for that. Uh, and we're gonna do this over two sessions. So if you've never seen breakout before, I have a quick video, hopefully, that you will be, all be able to see as to what we're going to be doing. So this is, uh, this is what we're gonna be creating at the end of the day, it's a, uh, a nice little game that moves about and is running on the uh, on the basis free board so it should be a good uh, a good fun uh, application to create and it will be a great um, it'll be a great learning experience for us as well because we're going to go through uh, several techniques you know we're going to put a uh, micro blaze processor in there we're going to use some high level synthesis we're going to use some rtl we're going to use some ip integrator uh, and it's going to be a lot of uh, it's going to be a real lot of fun uh, we've got a couple of people today from xilinx with us we have uh, Megan and Brittany with us from Xilinx, they're going to be monitoring the chat. Uh, so if you've got any questions or anything that I've missed that you want uh, further explaining, please please put it in there. We also uh, have put links into the material to enable you to get started uh, and to, to download it from, from my GitHub account if you've not already uh, if you've not already had a chance. All we need today for this is the material that's on the uh, on the git on the GitHub and Vivado, and Vivado, I'm going to be using Vivado 2020.2, uh, uh, but it's going to be, it, most versions of Vivado will be uh, will be fine along with the basis board. So our objective for today is to build the actual bitstream. So build the bitstream that we're then going to use in the next session uh, when we create the software application that's running in Vitus. So today we're going to be building uh, building this hardware application. So to do that, I'm going to be using Vivado. Um, so I'm going to switch my screen over now. So hopefully you can see my screen, uh, which is showing uh, is showing Vivado running. And we're going to take a step through, and we're going to run through this. So if you've been to the um, if you've been to the GitHub just one last time, you can download the step by step instructions, and that's what we'll be uh, that's what we'll be following them through today. The first step we're going to make actually is to make sure that we've got the correct board installed to to be able to target the basis tree. So the first thing we're going to do once we've got Vivado open is we're gonna to go to the Xhub stores, and we're gonna click on it and we're gonna open it. And now if you've not opened this before, I actually uninstalled the board earlier on just so as I could demonstrate this, uh, but we have the uh, Xhub store. So when that opens, we're gonna click on boards. We're gonna find the Digilint uh, part in there, and we're gonna scroll down until we see the basis three. Now, if you don't have a green little check mark next to it, uh, what we need to do is we just need to right click on it and click install. And this will go away, and it will get the uh, it will get the board from uh, the Xilinx board store, such that we can start using it within uh, within Vivado. Now we've got that board, we can actually begin to create our project. So what we're going to do is we're going to click on close, and then we're going to click on create project. I nearly went to open project, but we're going to click, click on create project. Once we've done that, we're going to click a location to a project that a project that we want to. Uh, the, a location that we want to store it in. So I'm going to call this one here, and I'm going to call this one uh, basis live because that's where we're that's what we're doing today. So I'm going to click on next to create the next project. We're going to create a register transfer level project, an RTL, an RTL project, but we're not actually going to specify any sources at this time. We're going to pull those in uh, in a in a little while. Uh, so we, can you just make sure you've got this option here ticked, which is do not specify sources at this time, and then click on the next button. Now here's why we needed to define the parts that we had installed on our uh, on our device. So we're going to go to boards, a little slow. We're going to go to the drop down menu here. We're going to select digital and ink, and in this case, the basis tree is the only board I have uh, have to target. What you can do is once we've done that is we're going to follow on and click on next then we're going to click on finish and this will give us a uh, this will give us a project that's going to be got everything we need to target the basis three the basis three board uh, so hopefully once we've got this basis three board uh, up and uh, up and running 
we'll be able to we can create a project and we can start working with it. So if you've never seen if you've never seen Vivado before, what you'll see here is the is the project summary. And when we've done our compilation and our implementation, we'll be able to see the uh, we'll be able to see everything here. Once we we can see all the sources that we're going to add into our design here, and then we have the flow manager down here where we're going to where we're going to control the flow of our design and show that and show that design. Once we've done this, the next, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to actually create a block diagram. So we're going to create a very visual design of our FPJ today. We're going to we're going to pretty much like using chunks of IP blocks to connect it all uh, to connect it all together. So we're going to click on. Uh, create block design under under the project manager flow navigator we're going to come over here and we're going to click on create block design now once we've got the block design uh, created what we're going to do is we're going to oh the option to create the block design what we're going to do is we're going to click on OK and we're going to leave that the names and everything everything as it is such that we can uh, such that we can use it now It'll take a few seconds to run through, and my machine always seems to run a little slower uh, when it's doing it when I'm doing it when I'm doing a webinar. Uh, but hopefully, uh, but once we've done that, you'll see several things appear. You'll see we get this nice uh, diagram here that we can create our can create our design on, um, and we also have the actions here, so we can see the so we can see the sources, the designs, the signals in our design. Importantly, though, we can see the we get this new tab called board, and this contains all of the information about the board. So it's board aware for the basis for the basis board. So it will actually show you all of the. It can help us pull through various elements if we want to try interfacing with them. So if we want to interface uh, with the, um, if we want to try it, interfacing. With the four, with the push buttons or the seven segment display, as we're going to do, we can we can use these uh, we can use these elements. So as we're looking through it, the first thing we're going to the first thing we're going to do actually is we're going to drag and drop some elements across onto the uh, onto the onto the block diagram. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to grab this here, the system, the system clock. And what we're going to do is we're going to pull this all the way across onto this block diagram. After a few seconds, we'll see that we get a nice warning saying we've uh, created a block diagram. Uh, and then we're going to click OK, uh, OK on that. What we're also going to do is we're going to pull across the, uh, the reset signal to give us a reset for this uh, for this clock. So what we're going to do is we're going to grab this reset signal down from the boards menu here, and we're going to drag that across, and you're going to see how it automatically uh, jumps to the uh, to the reset signal. So then we're going to click OK, and we've connected the reset. So we've now got a a clock and a reset connected into our board, and a clock wizard that's going to give us the ability to create the different clock frequencies that we want to use in our uh, in our design. What we're going to do then is we're going to double click on this clock wizard such that we can recustomize it and change the, the number of clocks that we've got coming out of it. So we're going to click on the clocking options and we're going to enable clock two and clock three. And clock one, we're going to set to uh, the, the high speed of 20 megahertz. So we're going to set that to 20 megahertz. We're going to set clock two to 25 megahertz this is really high speed logic design here and we're going to set clock free uh, to 50 to 50 megahertz uh, and once we've once we've done that so these you'll see actually that the requested frequencies as well become there so if you sometimes if you ask for a slightly different frequency uh, we can't get the uh, we can't get the video as we're going as we're going through that we can't we can't quite get the exact frequency but using this, uh, this we can. So that that works a lot, uh, a lot better with that. So we, once we see all this running through, we can click on OK. Uh, and as we've got that, now we've got that block diagram in there. The next thing we're going to do is actually we're going to add in a processor core. So we're going to take, we're going to put in a soft core processor, and we're going to use that. Uh, for a lot of our for a lot of our applications uh, and run and run through this. So what we're going to do then is we're going to click on this plus button here, 
And in this box here, we're going to type in microblaze. Or we're going to type in microblaze. And you'll see that we can bring in a microblaze. You see the microblaze system here. So we'll double click on that. And then we'll just zoom out a little bit. So now you can see that we have not only a clocking wizard, but we also have a processor, a processor system in our, in our device. Of course, so far, actually for the processor system, what we've not done yet is we've not actually configured this and got this configured for our application and for, for our system. So what we're going to do is we're going to do that in the, uh, in the next lab. So what we're going to do is we're going to click on this one. Vivado is really helpful. It wants to help us make a, sol make, make a solution. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to click on this option here called Run Block Automation. Now, this is going to go away and going to do some generation for us once we've configured the design exactly as we want it. So we're going to leave the preset at none. But the local memory is where our software application is going to run from. And actually, we're going to have a fairly large software application. So we're going to set this to have 128 kilobytes of uh, on-chip on memory. We're going to leave everything else unconfigured. So we're not going to have any ECC. We're not going to have any cache. We're going to want a debug module. And we definitely want the AXI, the AXI port enabled because we're going to be connecting things to it as we move down. And then finally, we're going to have a clock connection. And we're going to run this microblaze not very fast. We're going to run it at 20 megahertz. And this will help us achieve our time enclosure. Now, once we've done this, we're going to click OK. And we're going to wait a second or two. And you're going to see it's going to run through and it's going to recreate the system. Uh, around our around our device, such that we can start uh, doing it more. So now we've got a fully functional microblade system in our in processor in our design. It's got external block RAM memory. It can run from. It's got the clocks connected to it. It can run from. It's got a debugger connected, such that we can debug it in Vitus when we do the next session in Vitus, and it's got a reset system, such that when we've powered on the board, the reset system will bring the. Uh, in, in the board the board up. The next thing we want to do is to bring in a uh, AXI UR. So again, what we're going to do, because we at the moment we've got this nice little processor, but we couldn't even say hello world if we wanted to. So what we're going to do now is we're going to use the USB UR that's available on the uh, on the basis board and we're going to connect that in. So we're going to find this on the board. We're going to grab the USB UART and drag it across onto the uh, onto the block. And we're also going to do the same uh, with the uh, four push button switches. I'm going to drag that across and put that on there as well. So this is going to allow us to talk to the four push button switches and to the USB UART that we have on the bit on the basis board. The next step, though, is we're going to double click on the uh, GPIO block here to recustomize it, and we're going to actually turn it to. Uh, we're actually going to enable its second channel. We're going to make all the second channel all outputs, and we're going to set this to sixteen, a width of sixteen. And we're going to use this as part of our control system uh, for controlling some of the uh, some of the logic that we go as we go further on. So we're going to click OK on that. And I apologise. I realise this is going at quite a uh, quite a fast rate, uh, but we will be recording it and it will be available for you to watch later on. And um, if you've got any questions or anything, please you know please feel free to put it in the uh, in the in the chat. If there are, if you're having some video issues with it as well, I saw a few messages with that. I think there is an issue with some browser. I think Chrome might have some issues with it, but I'm not sure. But uh, there's a, uh, there is a, qu a quick Google might help you there as well to help solve that. So once we've got both of these, uh, once we've got both of this installed and, and created an in, what we're going to do. Uh, Oh, that's good. Chrome's. I'm glad Chrome's working uh, working well. Uh, what we're going to do is um, we're going to add in some custom IP. So if you cloned the repository that I made available earlier on from the 
uh, from the Git from the GitHub, you'll find there's a number of IP blocks in there. Uh, and the first one that we've got in there is we've got a, um, a hate, we've got a register transfer level file in there, and that's going to drive the seven segment LEDs. We have a constraints file that's going to control a little bit of the I/O uh, for us. That's not controlled by the uh, definition uh, on the board on the board file. And we've actually got a high level synthesis block that we're going to pop in there. Now that high level synthesis block's actually being written in C uh, and synthesized into RTL. And we'll take a look at that in the next lab. But that's actually the the element of the design that's going to be doing a lot of the drawing on the uh, on the wind on the window when you see it when you output this uh, externally it will be the um, it will be this HLS block that's running through a lot of the drawing what the microblazer is going to be doing is calculating the positions of the ball the positions of the bat and updating this HLS block as to where that as to where that data is so if we have this so so if you've cloned this and and hopefully I, I cloned it early on uh, we can go back to our sources uh, we can go to the add sources option here and we can see that we've got the option to add or create design sources. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to click on next on this one. And then we're going to click on add files and we're going to navigate to where you've downloaded your applicant, where you down, where you cloned the directory. So for me, it was just sort of one level down from where uh, from where I was, from where my project is working, and then we're going to add in the seven segment .bhd file. This is just a seven set, a simple file that will take a number and will pull it through and help you display it on that seven segment display that is available on the um, on the basis board. So we're going to click OK on that. We're going to copy the sources into the project. We don't have to do this, but it makes it a little bit a little bit easier uh, to do. Uh, and then we will click uh, we will click finish on that and that should bring the uh, that should bring the design uh, the design in I've just realized actually on the the slide that is uh, next slide 23 actually is, is, is slightly in the wrong position uh, so we'll come to that in a, in a moment we should actually be looking at uh, slide 20 uh, slide 24. so under our design sources now we should have this seven oh sorry I'm not, it's not in the wrong position. It is in the right position because we want to add the seven segment display onto the, uh, onto the top of the design. And we can't do that when it thinks it's the top level design. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna select this design one here, the block diagram. We're gonna right click on it and we're gonna ask Vivado to create us a VHDL block diagram. Uh, so we're gonna click on create HDL wrapper. We're gonna let Vivado manage it because we're really not interested in rewriting this netlist. Uh, every time we make a change. So we'll let Vivado manage it. And it fails due to clocking because it's hang on one second. Let's just connect these two clocks together. And then we'll try that again. Let Vivado do it. There we go. And what we can do then is we can right click on here and we can set the wrapper as the top level of our uh, of our HDL of our HDL file. And that's important because what we really want to do is we want to take this seven segment we want to take this seven segment LED file that we've just loaded into the design and we want to pull it across onto the block diagram such that it connects uh, such that it connects onto onto our design. Once we've got that, we're going to pull that across a little bit there. In fact, I'm just going to pop this window out so as we can perhaps see it a little bit better as I, as I work on it at a, at a higher level. Uh, so once we've got this, uh, what we want to do is we want to connect the, um, connect the output from the GP from the GPIO here, the, the one on output two that we've just created. Uh, and we want to connect it to the uh, to the input uh, to, so to the 15 input. And that's going to mean that when we write a number into this GPIO, 
into the second channel of this GPIO, what's going to happen is the number is going to appear on the uh, on the screen, and that's going to appear on the seven segment LED. Where are we in terms of clocking? Okay, and again, the clock we want to connect the clock to the twenty megahertz, uh, the twenty megahertz clock that we have uh, there as there as well. I just saw somebody in the comments just say that the uh, the slides that they don't have the slides. So if you've got the slides from Crowd Supply uh, in an email, they're telling you for a completely different uh, session, not this one. So this is this is different to the to the notebook that was perhaps provided by Crowd Supply. So you have to go to get the instructions for this lab. You have to go to the the uh, the GitHub uh, that's provided at the top. And download it uh, down and clone that directory and pull it down from and pull it down from there. Okay, once we've done that, what we're going to do is we're going to right click on these two and we're going to make the first one and we're going to select make external. And then on the second one here, we're going to right click it and we're going to select make external again. Now, just because I have a slight difference uh, in the um, in the namings, and I've set up all the XDC the constraints files. We need to change the we need to change the names of these of these two signals that have just been created uh, to match the XDC file for E. So I'm just going to pop this dock this back in a second, just so as you can see what I'm going to do, uh, and then I'm going to collect click on this seven segment one here, and over in the external port properties, I'm going to select this one. And I'm going to change its name to seven underscore seg. Uh, and I'm going to select this one as well. And I'm going to double click on that. Uh, I'll click on this one actually there. And I'm going to change this one's names to seven seg LED underscore AM. So we've got there to drive the seven segment anodes and the uh, and, and cathodes. Uh, once we've done that, no, you're right. Somebody spotted my error there. It shouldn't have been connected to that. It should have been connected to uh, to. It should have been connected uh, to the uh, to the clock lines. It was a simple mismatch I made, John, when I was just trying to get the. Um, just trying to get the top level block diagram, uh, the top level VHDL created such that I could make that the top level and import this seven segment uh, LED. Once we've done that, actually, once we've done this, I'm going to run the connection automation just so as we can connect in the GPIO and the AXI into our, uh, into our AXI network. That'll take a second or two to run through. And then back in the block diagram, black in the block diagram, you'll see now that the uh, UR light and the GPIO, that they're connected into this AXI network. And this AXI network is connected to the microblue. So now we've got a processing system that's connected to the uh, connected to the GPIO, to the push buttons. It can drive the seven segment element. And it can also it can also send out messages over the over the UARTs. So while we do this, I'll just pause for a second while everybody kind of, uh, if anybody's following along, if they catch up, I'll take a quick scroll uh, scroll through uh, and see if there's any questions uh, I can uh, help with. But please, if you've got any questions or any comments, please push, please put through and, and let me know. Uh, I saw somebody asking about if you could do this on the snickerdoodle, uh, and you can follow through, and you can you can put you can do all this on the snickerdoodle. Uh, the one issue, obviously, with the snickerdoodle is you don't it doesn't natively if you've just got the song, it doesn't natively have a video output port. You would need something like the snickerdoodle pie smasher or something uh, to uh, be able to connect an output, and in that case, you'd be outputting over over HDMI, but. But the concepts and the techniques and everything I'm showing here uh, can be done and used across everything else that we're going to 
uh, going to see. So now we've got this, what we want to do is we want to pull in, as I said, we're going to be using a high level, uh, we're going to be using a high level synthesis uh, IP. Yeah, one. Where are they coming from? Ah, yes, 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 yes. That's a good question. So somebody was just asking a question about whether the clocks uh, should be connected to the to the clock out or to the clock input, and that's actually a good point in that I've actually misconnected the clocks. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just disconnect this clock oh, disconnect flex like the pin and disconnect the pin now i'm going to select this one and disconnect this pin and then we're going to select the ones on here and just disconnect these pins as well I've selected the entire thing doing that. Select that one, disconnect pin, and that one. I think we can leave some of these, but I'll disconnect them all, and then we'll just reconnect them all to the... Uh, so, yeah, so they should all be connected to this 20 meg clock. So this is what we will uh, connect them all to. Um, oddly enough, actually, it would have been, um, just to give it all... It would have probably it would have been okay because the slave clocks the the clock domain crossing would have kind of happened in the um, in the AXI peripheral block here, uh, provided it's all done. But now everything is nicely all, all running, all connected on that nice and simple uh, output output clock. And actually, we need to make this one the output clock as well. So everything we've got there is running uh, at the um, at the twenty at the twenty meg clock that you can see now. Yeah. Live projects, right? So what we've now we've got that. What we want to do is we want to add in our HLSIP core into into the design. And this is what we've created now is a is a microblaze processing system. So if we wanted to run Hello World. We could run Hello World if we wanted to uh, read the state of the buttons. We could read the state of the buttons. But as of yet, we've not got anything that's going to give us that that video output path, that that output uh, thing, or draw or draw the game as we were as we were showing. So what we're going to do is we're going to add in a new repository. So to do this, we're in the project manager view. Uh, we're going to go to uh, tools. Where's it gone? We're going to go to the IP catalog. Once we've got the IP catalog, you can see that we've got the Vivado repository. Uh, but actually, what we need to do is we need to instantiate our own uh, IP repository at this point in time. So we're going to right click on here uh, and we're going to say add repository. And it's going to give us a location that we want to add a repository in there. So I'm just going to do this. I'm going to create a new directory under there and call it IP repo. Hopefully I can uh, actually, now I'm going to put it under that one. And I'm going to call it IP repo. So you'll see I've just created a new directory uh, that this is going to be the, um, be the uh, location for the IP repo. And you'll see as well, once we've added that, we don't get any IP added to it. So sorry, someone in the comments was just saying they can't see the PDF files. They should be available under the um, under the lab one. So if you go to the, uh, I'll just put this up on my screen. If you go to the crowd supply area, you go to lab one, you should see lab one.pdf, which gives you the, um, gives you the, uh, the, the instructions. Where's that gone then? Okay, so if you do that, you should be able to find you should be able to find those there. 
however as we've got nothing in the ip repo here we've got no ip in it we've not actually added any into it yet uh, so what we want to do is we want to get that and add the hls ip block in so what we're going to do is we're going to click on ok and then we're going to select this user ip repo that we've just uh, just created and then we're going to go to uh, add IP to repository. I'm going to click on that. And then it's going to open that in the IP repo where we, the location where we stored our IP repo. Uh, so if we go up and if we navigate to where we downloaded, um, if we navigated and worked out where we downloaded the, uh, where we cloned the directory uh, from, from Crowd Supply, what you'll see is you'll see this, um, this zip file uh, which it, which contains the implementation of the high-level synthesis design. So if we click on OK there, we'll see that come down. And then underneath the uh, the directory structure, what you should see is a not only now do we have a, a IP under there, but we also have this HUD uh, available under the uh, under the IP repo. And from that, we can start. We can start working with it, and we can uh, start using it in our designs. So this module, the hood module that we're adding in, is actually what's going to draw. So if you remember back to the video I showed at the start of the project, just to answer a question from somebody in the chat, if you go back to the video I showed at the start of this as to where we're working from. So this HLS module is actually the module that's going to draw all the positions. So it's going to draw the. Uh, it's going to draw the ball and it's going to draw the bat and it's going to do all the movement it's going to do all the movement in real time in live real time as we're as we're doing it and in the next session we'll probably get time to take a look at that hls code that c code and show you what's in there but it's much easier to write code in c and use hls to get that implementation than it is uh to run that so your your system clock uh, so somebody was just asking system clock is connected with a clock wizard clock one is that okay so the system clock should come in and it should run into the system clock clock one uh, and it should go through and it should create everything uh, everything else there's a lot to one go so that should give us a nice um, a nice solution I think actually that reset tree might cause us a issue there because that's on the wrong reset so i'm just going to disconnect that pin uh, and then it should be connected to that network there uh, because we've got everything to just make it all synchronous to the right to the right to the right clock but yeah you should see that system clocking uh going <laughs> going on sorry john you need to have this up vibrato up and the instructions up i i realize it's a it's a challenge, but it, it, the video will be available so as you can look through it and and you can also uh, ask lots of questions. You've got my email, so any questions you get stuck, just email me. Uh, it's much more fun doing it live than it is doing it sort of, uh, you know, you practice several times and it all works okay, and then you do it live and you connect the clocks up wrong. Um, so now we've got our HLS. What we're going to do is we're going to start working through and adding in the video pipeline. Essentially, this is the and this is the pipeline that's going to get us to be able to talk to the VGA uh, that's displayed on the um, on the screen. So we're going to click on that plus button again, and we're going to add in the uh, we're going to add in the HUD button. So we're going to type in HUD, and hopefully we should see it there, so we can see our HUD. So we're going to double click on that. And that will bring in the hood. We're also going to add in a couple of other IP from the Vivado library. So from the Vivado IP library, we're going to add in the um, test pattern generator. And we're going to add in the mixer. Oh, wrong. Uh, you're going to add in the mixer. Uh, so we're going to take in the mixer. So we've got these uh, three now. That's uh, jumped in. Uh, so we've got these four four elements essentially: the uh, the test pattern generator, the head up, the uh, 
HLS one that we've generated and the uh, and the video mixer. Bruce will not need four, you'll only, by the end of this, hopefully you'll only need two by the time we're getting to the second session. Uh, but uh, it's all, it'll all be good fun uh, as we go, as we go for it. What we're going to do is we're going to double click on this mixer block. So this, uh, this mixer block is going to allow us to layer levels of video on top of each other. So what we're going to do is we're going to have the video test pattern generator, and that's going to be able to create colorful backgrounds for us. And we can change that however we want. We're going to have the hood that's going to control the bats and the balls. And we're going to have the video mixer that's going to layer all this together onto the same video for us, uh, such that we can we, we can layer the videos layer the videos together. But we do need to configure this correctly. So if we double click on this, um, yes, the hood IP is the one that was added from the uh, from the IP repo. Uh, that's the uh, that's a badly named heads up display. Uh, it's uh, it's really the it's really an overlay generation. Uh, but that's the, that was the name I selected to give it. So we need to set this correctly. So and the size of the some of these configurations and setting options that we do on here uh, will give us a, a larger foot in, a larger implementation in the logic. And we've got a fairly limited logic. So what we're going to do is we're going to set the top for RGB. We only want one sample per clock. Uh, we actually only want one overlay layer. So this is going to give us the main input, and it's going to give us one overlay layer. And then we're going to change the maximum size because we're never going to be dealing with like a full HD screen in the in the Artix. So we're going to set this to 800, and we're going to set this to 800. So we can, we can really display an 800 by 800 uh, IP, uh, uh, an 800 by 800 frame as we're working through this. And on layer one, in, importantly, we're on layer one, we're going to set this to be RGBA. So we're going to find from this list, we're going to find RGBA, which will be in here somewhere. RGBA. Yes, that's the one. RGB. So one of these was done on RGBA. So that's going to give us an alpha channel. Uh, so we've got a, uh, Carlos, we're not really going to use the square resolution. It's just a little bit of a, uh, a, a little, just, just a little bit, just in case anybody gets it wrong. In reality, we're going to be generating a, an image that's a lot, that's, that's a lot, a lot lower than, a lot lower than the 800 by 600. We're going to, we're going to go with, for the final one, we're going to go with six, 640 by 480, I think is going to be the final, is the final, what we program in software. Uh, just being an engineer, I just wanted to add some. Uh, some wiggle room, shall we say, just in case people wanted to explore an experiment. So this is going to give us eight bits, eight bits red, eight bits green, eight bits blue, and eight bits alpha. And that alpha bit is what's going to determine the the op opacity of the pixel as to whether it whether it overrides the background image or not. So, and we're going to change this to be a streaming type. Uh, and then we're going to select RGB. So, yes, we select RGBA and streaming type there, and we click on OK. You'll see we've then got a AXI control port. So this is a slow speed. I don't know why I'm touching my monitor. We have an AXI slow speed control port, and this is how we're going to configure it over software. We have an AXI video stream input and a AXI uh, video video one. Uh, and these are the inputs that we're going to use to do our video. And we'd better get this the right way around, otherwise we're going to end up with uh, overlays. Uh, so somebody was asking, what's the impact if you keep them at the maximum? Uh, so it, it will it will just use more logic resources because obviously it's got to be able to um, to handle that, to have the resources in the logic to do that. So it'll it'll use more logic. We're then going to double click on the test pattern generator. And we're going to change this again just to, we don't really need a 4K one, so I'm just going to say it, we might want up to 800 by 800. And I'm going to leave all the zoom, the zoom bars and everything, but I'm going to turn off the foreground. I'm going to turn off the foreground pattern as well, just to give me a little bit more saving. And I'm going to click OK on there. Now, what I should say, actually, is if you've cloned this repo, there's already a solution. There's already a solution in there, a, a, a compiled uh, project in there, and, and bit streams and XSAs and everything in there anyway. 
But as you bring this down, what we're going to do now, is we're going to begin to connect this together. So I'm just going to move this hood down a little bit. And I'm going to take the video out from the video test pattern generator. I'm going to connect it to video in zero. Because that's the base, that's the base video upon which we're going to add on the, the various layers. Once we've done that, we're going to take the hood output and we're going to connect that to the video one there. And then we're going to run the connection automation. We're not going to worry about the external reset in on the on that one there. But we're going to certainly we're going to click on the AX at the hood generation, the slave control, and the TPG control. And we're going to change the clock source as such that it is the 50 megahertz clock. Because we want to be able to, this is our image processing line. Uh, so we want to be able to process uh, data in this pipeline much faster than we would uh, if we were doing it other ways. Uh, so the pixel rate, actually, so this is a good one. So someone's just asking, how do we select the, the, the clock rate to use? Uh, so the clock rate for the output is actually the 25 megahertz. Um, is actually the 25 megahertz uh, free clock that we did, and that's what's needed for a 640 by 480 output. The clock for the 50 megahertz for the image processing chain is because I want that to be running slightly faster than the output clock, than the pixel clock, such that we can buffer those in the in a, in a as yet to be instantiated IP. Uh, and, and using twice the clock frequency in this case, because it's relatively slow. Gives us a nice gives us a nice approach to to doing that. So we're going to click on OK for that, and that's going to run through. And we should see then that we've got the. Um, if I click on maximize my design, we should see then that we've got this third clock that's connected to this, and these are all connected and running at uh, 50 uh, 50 megahertz. Uh, the stream's going to be running at 50 megahertz. The slaves are running at 50 megahertz. So everything's nicely, uh, all nicely done there in our design. And you can see the AXI peripheral as well down here. That's actually pulled it through and is running at and, and has got the got everything all correct connected. So it will do all the clock domain crossing and everything that we're going to do uh, will be included as part of that. So I'm just going to regenerate my layout a little bit just so as we can see it a little bit better. And what you'll see now then, now we've got this, is what we've got is we've got a, oh, we're not doing too bad for time. I was a bit worried about this. What we've got is we've got a microblade system at the, as, our, as our starting point. We have a, obviously we have the UART to give us a hello world, and that's going to be one of the first things we check in the next session. We have the GPIO to control the four buttons, and we're going to use those four buttons to control our design. So we're going to use those four buttons um, to move the paddle left and right. But actually, the up and down buttons, they're actually going to change the width of the paddle. So as you can cheat and make it, make it harder or easier. What we've got then, what we've done then is we've put this hood in this head up display so this is the and uh, this module really is the module that draws where the ball is and draws the bat so it draws the size of the bat and the position of the bat on the screen and where the ball is on the screen the microblazer is going to be keeping track of where the ball where the ball should be according to its algorithms and where the bat is from where you've moved it but that the microblazer is going to be telling this heads up display where to draw the ball where to draw the uh, where to draw the bat on every frame. So it's going to every frame. It's going to draw it, draw it into place. The test pattern generator that's going to give us the background. So we've got a nice background, and we can have a in the example video I showed. I've got the color bars, but you could have a you could have a red background, a black, black, white, green. You know, you could have a different pattern background if you wanted to, just to make it a little bit more, a little bit more interesting. And then we've got this AXI video. We've got this video mixer here that's gonna that's gonna mix the two video layers together and put the heads up display on top of the back on top of the test pattern generator such that you can see the ball and the bat as it as it moves as it moves about what we need to do now though is we need an output 
path we need to be able to display on the VGA output signal we need to be display on the VGA outputs uh, and the VGA output on the basis board is actually it's quite straightforward uh, it uses a simple art it uses a simple resistor divider to create the to create the color so we're just going to use the four colors uh, we're going to be using like a four bit resolution really at the end of the day for this for each color so four red four green four blue uh, but first, what we need is we need to get, we've got this AXI stream interface and the data is represent the videos coming through as an AXI stream, which is pretty much just a, 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 non, a continuous stream of data. And we need to be able to convert that into a timing signals that the T that a TV can use to, you know, to know when to start a line, when to end a line, when to start a frame, when to end a frame. Uh, and to do this, we're going to add in uh, a couple of additional blocks to help us generate all that timing and work so the first thing we're going to add in is the video timing block so we're going to add in the video timing controller and we're going to add in a constant can't type today a constant block now what we're going to do is we're going to double click on the video timing controller to re-customize it again and we really want this to just be generating the timing waveforms for our video. We don't want it to be, be detecting the timing because that's not what we're, we don't have a video input, we're just doing a video output. So we're gonna disable the uh, detection and we're gonna leave the enable, uh, we're gonna leave the enable going. And we're not gonna make any other changes uh, to that. And we're gonna click okay on that. And then we're going to run the connection automation again. Uh, we're going to select the control here. And we can leave the auto, but I'm going to select the 20, 20 megahertz clock. And run that. And there you'll see that that's being connected and pulled through into our AXI control, uh, control network. What we want to do then is we need to add in a AXI stream to video out so this block here and double click on it so this is the block that's actually going to convert the AXI stream into a two-dimensional array using the information from the timing controller that's given to it so we're going to double click on the AXI stream block to recustomize it again uh, we're going to leave pretty much everything uh, the same apart from we're going to tell it it's got independent clocks and that is that the the AXI stream clock is diff is a different clock frequency to the uh, clock for the um, to the clock for the uh, pixel clock for the clock output once we've done that we'll see it recustomize and draw and then we're going to go from here we're going to connect the video timing out to the video timing in <coughs> oh, excuse me we're also going to connect the let's connect we're going to connect the clock enable to these clock ends even though it says n and it's got a little circle on the end it's a little bit of a bug in a little bit of a bug in vibrato uh, because they're actually enables that need to be active high not uh not resets that need to be active uh active low. so we're going to connect those two uh to that to give us uh to give us that We're going to connect the, where's my screen gone? We're going to connect the output video from here, from the video mixer. We're going to take that across and we're going to connect that. Oh, I've picked up the interrupt pin. That's quite annoying. We're going to take that across to the video in uh, such that we can uh, we can see that video, uh, video in. And then we're going to connect the uh, AXI stream clock here. So this A clock, we're going to connect this to video to three. Uh, because it's running at um, it's running at of it's running at the uh, three megahertz uh, sign time. Uh, we're also going to connect the enable one with the enable. We're going to connect the enable to the to this one here, and we're going to connect the video out chip enable to the chip enable as well. Okay, VTCs, clocks, 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 that's all done. We're going to connect the VTGCE pin here. We're going to connect that back to the 
gen clock enable here and this allows the video what this allows it allows the video controller to the video stream to output to be able to put back pressure on the timing controller and adjust it and adjust it slightly and we're going to connect the sos of sof starter frame output to the sof state there as well and then what are we going to do once we've got all that done we're going to connect the clock here so we've not so far we've not used clock two so we're going to connect clock two here to the clock here so this is the 25 meg clock so this is the pixel clock uh, so we're going to connect that to the video timing controller such that the video timing controller generates a timing at the right pixel frequency and then we're going to we're then going to connect the output clock here also to that to that clock there such that we have the uh, have the right data let's just click on regenerate just so as we can see it make a little bit more begin to hopefully make a little bit more sense to us now uh, as to what's going as to what's going off we need to connect some of the um some of the reset signals actually we've not we've not done that so we need to connect the reset signal here the axi reset signal uh to the uh that's a 50 meg clock so we need to connect that one to there and we need to add a there's actually no need for that that doesn't go anywhere uh, and we actually need to add in another i could have just used the same reset one um how did that go Just sworn I added one in there. Clock one, clock two. There we go. Clock three. We need a clock, a third clock reset, just to work off our second, uh, our second clock here. We can add in the DCM locked to the locked, and the external reset to the external reset, and then we can take the peripheral reset across to the video in reset there just redraw that again so now hopefully everything should be coming together um uh and we we, we now hopefully everything should be coming together somebody was just asking if this can be done in 2019.2 and yeah there's no reason why it can't be done in 2019.2 uh, and someone was asking if it can be done with the clock gen goes from the vtc uh, so the VTC, so VT, VTG chip enable goes to the clock gin, uh, clock in enable there, and that just allows you to put some back pressure uh, on uh, on the uh, on the design. What we're going to do now is I'm just going to pop this back into the uh, Vivado window for for a second, and you'll see why in a, you'll see why in a minute. But I'm going to zoom in over in this area of the design, and I'll try and make it as big as possible. Uh, and I'm going to expand this output here. And then I'm going to click on certain things. So I'm going to click on the, um, the video horizontal sync. And I'm going to ask to make that external. Uh, and I'm going to click on it. And I'm going to, over here, I'm just going to rename that page sync. And we're going to do the same for the video sync, for the, for the V sync down here. make external and we're going to do that there we're going to do vsync vsync so we've got now the vertical and the horizontal sync and this is going to tell the monitor that we're using how to how to draw it and how and where to draw it on the screen and then finally what we're going to do is we're going to add in free slice ip blocks and this is because the um the output can only uh, the output videos i was saying is only available to actually output four bits not the oh, not the eight bits that we want so we're going to ask this to uh, we're going to use these slices 
just come over here and then I'll zoom in a bit. We're going to use these slices to essentially prune off the video. So we've got a 24 bit pixel coming out. Uh, and what we need is essentially we need to pick off each color channel um, and pull it and pull it through. So we need to pull that color channel out. We need to find the correct color channel in the position and then pull that, just pull the four the, the four bits out from it. So this is what we're gonna uh, we're gonna do. So slice zero, we're gonna double click on, and we're gonna tell it that there's a 24 bit input, uh, and we want it from bits nine to 17 sorry I lied it's not a four bit it's not a four bit it's a three bit resistor it's a three bit resistor DAC so we're going to tell that we want from 19 uh, to 17 we're going to do the same for slice one we're going to get again tell it it's 24 uh, that we want 11 to 9 and for slice 3 it's 24 and we want 3 to 1 okay so this is going to give us the uh, this is going to prune us the bits that we want and what we're going to do is we're just going to, again, we're going to make these outputs, make external, make external. Make sure you're clicking on the pin, not the module, uh, make external. I'm going to save that. And then we're going to set slice, let me get this the right way around. So slice zero, we're going to call VGA red. Slice one. We're going to call VGA, VGA blue. And then slice three, we're going to call VGA green. And this will give us all of the uh, elements that we want to uh, that we want to do. Okay, we've run through that one, okay, that one, okay, that one. So we should have, I'm going to pop this out now because we're getting nearly at the hour. Oh, it's a good job we said an hour-ish. I'm going to rerun the routine, re reorganize it. And we can see now we have a nice, oh, that's, where's that, where, that's where that one went. You can see now we have a nice flow uh, where we have the microblaze, pro, we have the microblaze processor. We have the interconnects. We have the video elements down here. We have the, the, the video creation elements here. We have the video timing element here. The GPIO, which is connected to the push buttons. Um, we have the we have all our outputs here. So we have our USB UART, the seven segment display, and the slices for the, uh, for the, for the video. And everything there should be OK. So if I've drawn this correctly in the, in the hour, uh, we should be able to run the validation. If this validates with no errors, I'm going to be quite. I'm going to be quite happy. Uh, so we've we've run that through, and hopefully you should see that in your design that there are no errors or critical warnings in the design. And that's really good because all we need to do now is now we've got the design ready. Um, we need to just add in the constraints. Uh, for the outputs uh somebody said about a stream fifo we'll talk about that in a minute because i do i didn't actually add a stream fifo into the design unless you're talking about under the um under the timing module the hysteresis oh the fifo depth fear uh and i and it just gets left as the default value of 1020 as 1024 uh, and that's just the fifo that it stores the pixels in before it tries to synchronize with the timing controller uh, to give you the to give you the output. Now back on the sources tab, we're going to click on to add in the constraints. We're going to click on the add sources tab. Only this time, we're going to click on the um, we're going to click on the add or create constraints. We're going to click on next, and this time we're going to click add files, and we're going to pull in the 
io.xdc that we created uh, earlier on, that we pulled down earlier on from the, from the GitHub. We're going to click OK on that. Uh, we're going to allow that to copy the constraints into the project. We're going to click on finish. Um, and then we'll see the constraints under under our designs, uh, under our designs here with all the with all the pins mapped through as we would uh, as we would expect. Now, what we can do then is all we have to do now. And this is why uh, this is why this. Uh, project ends at this point in time and when we've just about taken the hour uh, is click is save the design and then we can click on this element here which is and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna run mine because it'll start using a lot of computer process which will slow down the slow down the video stuff I'm sure but if I click on generate bitstream I will get this I will get this launch runs come up which will ask me to launch my runs. Uh, and then if you click on OK, I'm going to click on cancel for, for this. Uh, but that will then run you through the design and it will take you through. And what you'll see up here is when this is all completed, you'll see a bitstream, right bitstream completed uh, tick here. And you'll be able to see uh, in the downstream here in the project summary, you'll be able to see the utilization and, and the timing constraints. Now, we're going to leave the lab here for this session one at the hour because hopefully if you've all followed along you've got to that point it's going to take a variable amount of time depending upon your machines to do this place and route and implementation because we're going to use quite a bit this is going to use quite a lot of the resources of the of the machine to do that so it's going to take a, it's going to take a little time to uh, sorry resources of the device to do so it's going to take a little time to run through and give you all that time enclosure and everything and pull it all and pull it all together what you'll see at the end of this is a, is a completed bitstream and in the next lab on the 1st of april so if you've enjoyed this one uh the next one will be a little slower because we don't have quite as much to fit in uh but it but, but it, if you've enjoyed that one then please register for the if you've not already done so please register uh for the one on the 1st of april and we will run you through creating the software and and getting your uh, well we'll run you through two things the first thing we're going to run you through is proving that the microblaze actually works the next thing after that is actually creating the application once we've seen that the microblaze can say hello world uh, so this should run through and it should complete if by the off chance it doesn't or uh, or you don't get chance to do it or you don't have the board but you want to follow along uh, on the crowd supply workshop uh, you will see that I've already that I've made it up. Oh, you can't see because it it's under the exit row, but you, you'll see that I've already made available to you the um, the design one dot xse, uh, and that's the that's the compiled output that you need from Vivado at this point in time. So if you if you can't compile it, if you're taught if you if you're taught if your process is taking too long, or uh, you know you come across an unexpected bug in Vivado on a particular operating system implementation. Uh, everything you need to get started with Lab 2 uh, is there. John, you were just saying, when will Lab 2 be pushed to Git? Uh, we've just reviewed the uh, documentation now, the, the lab guide, uh, so we'll be, we'll be pushing it together. Uh, we'll be pushing it out in the, next few, uh, in the next few days, hopefully. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm going to come back to the, to the video. And I'm going to ask you before, before we end this session, I'm going to well, first off, I'm going to thank you all for coming. Uh, and I hope it's been I hope it's been informative, um, and and you've learned a lot. So somebody was just saying, what about the XDC? Are these data already configured in the basis board files? And actually, they're not. So not all of them are. So if you take a look in, let me just share my screen again. Uh, so if you take a look at my Vivado, if you take a look at the board definition here that, that's defined in the board output, we have the USB UART, the reset, we have the PMOD connectors, we have the switches and LEDs, the seven segment display, anodes and cathodes, and, and we've not connected to them. We're using, because we're using a specific uh, specific driver block that I've written, uh, we're not using that, because if you pull that across, 
all it will pull across is GPIOs for you to write and control in software. And I've actually written an RTL block that makes it a lot easier. In, in essence, my RTL block, you just pass it the number you want to display and it will display it. Whereas if you pull the if you pull those two across, you would have to work that out for yourself. We're not doing anything with the QSPI memory in this one. So you don't need to you don't need to do that. But you'll notice that the VGA is missing. Uh, and that's what we have under here. So we've we've mapped in the seven segment display because we're using it in a we're using it in a different way. And we've mapped in the uh, the v and we've mapped in the VGA connector uh, as well, and then we've made a few changes to the VGA connector uh, to the VGA standards, so the drive strength and such like. Because I had a rather uh, rather large. Uh, it is John. It's a shame it doesn't come out with the board files, but I had a rather large cable, and I noticed that if uh, if I was driving it too high uh, with a too fast a current and too fast a drive strength, it was it was perhaps clipping occasionally on the VGA standard, and it was upsetting my monitor a little bit. Yeah, the US and John makes a good point. You know, the USB uh, PS2 port is not on there, and the, is not on the list neither. But everything, everything we've taught you today, you know, you can adapt if you want to work with the VGA or you want to work with the USB PS2 port. And maybe if this labs, maybe if people like this lab, we'll do. You know, and after we've done the game, we can perhaps consider in a month or so doing a, doing another different lab on the basis uh, or something with a different with a different interface. Uh, so this is it. So if you click go, now you should have everything you need uh to get to get going and come join us with that second part like i say if you hit any issues everything you need is available on the github to come back and do the second part anyway so we're not gonna uh, we're not gonna leave you hanging and, and out there on your own uh we will definitely uh, we've definitely provided that update and i'll provide as part of the third element as part of the second lab i'll provide you all the programming files and everything as well the, the final programming files and everything as well so uh, someone was just asking if I show the generation of the platform interfaces in the next lab. Uh, actually, no, because we're not doing any. We're just going to use the embedded flow for this. So we're going to be using the embedded uh, Xilinx flow, not the accelerated flow, because it's not a it's an Artix device. It's not an MPSOC or a uh, or a Zinc or, a, or an ACAP device. It's, it's just a standard uh, sort of normal um, normal FPGA. Uh, so that 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 accelerated flow is not not really suitable. So we'll just be going with the normal embedded development flow inviters. So in the next lab, we'll just be running through uh, how to first off how to prove that we've not done something silly with the microblaze, you know, and held something in reset when we should have held it in reset. Uh, but we'll be showing you how you can run that through. And then in uh, the second half of the lab, we'll be looking at creating that application and writing writing that software. And if we get time, if it's not as rushed as today, uh, or it's or there's room available, uh, or there's time available, or we run over a few minutes like we have done today, then what we'll do is we'll take we can take a look in the the HLS code for this uh, for this heads up display block as well. If anybody wants to, uh, if anybody wants to take a look at that. So. Finally, is there any any questions, comments, or anything? Thank you to please put it in. Uh, I'm I'm glad to see that somebody's generated the bitstream already. Uh, I was a bit worried because if I I generated the bitstream on this one, I when I ge generated it, I click go, and because I've got quite a powerful Linux machine running, it just literally hit 100% utilization of all the processors. So I, I didn't want to do that just in case it sort of dropped out and and did this. But if you've got that bitstream you're good and ready to go for the next one and like i say the first of uh, the first of april is the next one it's uh, it's april's april fool's day actually i'd not i'd not thought about that uh, but that's april fool's day so it'll be good fun um any questions in the meantime my email address is in the lab book that you've just downloaded uh, so please feel free to email me and and reach out uh, and again, if you're if you're interested and you like the stuff I'm doing and seeing, there's a lot more of this on my website at aduvioengineering.com, uh, and and people can uh, and people can see that as well. Particularly if you want to learn about other things such as Vitus acceleration and zincs and microblazers and such like. Right. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it there. I, I feel like I've talked for talked at you for hours. So thank you very much uh, for coming. Uh, Michael, should, Michael will say thank, what should be on the table for next time. 
uh, and that is basically you're going to need the you're going to need your basis tree board if you've got one. Uh, you're going to need a USB cable to power it, and you're going to need an Ethernet cable and a monitor that does VGA as well. If you've got a monitor that does VGA, such that you can uh, such that you can partake and play that play the game uh, at the end of it. No Ethernet. We're not going to need Ethernet. I don't think there's Ethernet on the basis free board, is there? I don't. I actually don't have one to hand, and I'm kind of tethered to my uh, to my to my monitor at the moment. Uh, but no, so there's no no Ethernet. But it, uh, everything's going to be done. We'll be, you know we'll be debugging and, and building it over the um, over the JTAG uh, debugger, just like you would any normal embedded software. So, right, I've been talking for far too long. I need to get a glass of water. So, thank you very thank you very much for coming, Maga, Megan, Brittany, Rebecca. You know, thank you very much for answering the questions as people have done. If you've written a question and it's kind of scrolled past and I didn't answer it, uh, please don't think that I ignored it because I, I, I probably just missed it. So please just pop it in an email and we'll take a shot from there. But anyway, I'm going to end this now. So thank you. Thank you very much. And once this is out, if you keep an eye on my uh, social media channels and my blog, uh, we'll publish we'll publish all the links to this uh, such that you can such that you can see it and, and take it from there. Okay. Thank you very much. Have a good evening, good day, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world, and please stay safe in the uh, in the pandemic. And I will uh, see you all later. Thank you very much. Bye bye.